All right, welcome. We are now officially live on the webinar. We still have a couple minutes until we start. Um, but what uh, I always love to do when getting these webinars started is find out where people are tuning in from. That also validates to me that the sound is working, that the video is working, because I get to hear from, from those of you that are on this page right now that you can hear me, that you can see me, but also uh, Kathy, Welcome from North Texas, fighting frack quakes. Um, Carolyn from Albuquerque, um, in also uh, San Sandoval County, New Mexico. Peach Latte says it's all clear. Um, hey, Ranjana from Arlington, livable Arlington. Awesome. I'm glad you could make it, Ranjana. Um, great smiley face. So yeah, one of the things is uh, in the chat. You can leave me emojis too. That'll help move things forward for sure. Welcome Nicole from North Dakota. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna get in and Sarah on the screen as well. I'm gonna take advantage of this uh, couple moments here. So t -t 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 I see some other people in the, in the audience because Crowdcast shows me not just the chat, but there's a, it's great. Looks like there's 30, 31 people already here, uh, including some folks that I met last weekend, the weekend before last, at the People versus Oil and Gas Conference in Pittsburgh. So that was that was great to connect with people there. Um, I learned a lot. It was a, a really powerful experience. It met met some great people, learned stories from different parts of the struggle. Um, so just a moment, let me get Ryan and Sarah on the screen here. Hey Sam, nice to nice to see you from Pittsburgh, from DC. Ron from PA, Steve from St. Charles, Illinois, Pete from San Antonio, Texas, Nicole from North Dakota. Wow, this is a great turnout. This is a really good turnout. Um, Karen from PA. So in just a moment, Ryan and Sarah are going to join us from the Environmental Health Project office. Greg from Columbus, Natalie from PA, Ellen from New York. Awesome. This is, this is really great. So just a sec, let's see. I'm gonna double check. Great, Peter would like to learn more about people versus oil and gas. Awesome. If anybody on the chat um, wants to drop a link in or was involved in the in the conference, oh, good. Hey, what's up, Ryan? Hey, how are you? Doing good. Hey, Sarah. Hi. I'm back to substance useful. <laughs> Glad everything's good. Everything's working. Um, cool. I'm gonna fire up the slideshow real quick, um, and and introduce you all. These are our, our fantastic guests today tuning in from, well, joining us from the Environmental Health Project office in, um, in Pennsylvania. All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. So just a sec, let me... Let me fix a couple things. Looks like you see the big um, <laughs> hall of mirrors. So let me fix that. There we go. How's that look? Does that look good? Yeah. Ryan, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Great. Okay. Yeah. So welcome everybody to the webinar. Let me tell you a little bit about what you're going to see in today's presentation. So you're going to learn how the Environmental Health Channel visualizes impacts of oil and gas, how the Environmental Health Project collects valuable data, and you're going to meet some people or learn how to connect with some people who can help you protect your community from the harms of fracking. So before we start, we already did a little bit of this. I'm joining this webinar from dot, dot, dot. So welcome everybody who jumped in the chat. You're still welcome to do that. Um, tell us something that you're looking to learn. And also, 
I wanted to point out that you can ask questions um, in the questions area. So it's like right at the bottom of your screen, you can see the questions area. Um, when you leave a question there, what happens is when we get to the Q&A portion, we can actually hit uh, start answering that question so that in the future, those questions then become searchable, searchable in the video for other people that watch the replay. So, but you can also just drop in questions as soon as you have them. So anyway, this will be recorded as well. So if you have to leave early, we'll make sure to send it to you. The presentation is only, um, well, the entire webinar, including the Q&A period, is only about 30 minutes long, but we will have some time to hang out and chat if, if we need to. But just know that we will wrap up after 30 minutes with the structured part of this presentation. So my name is Ryan Clover Owens. I'm part of Health to Harm Network uh, operations team. So I'm involved in the website and I'm hosting webinars. So there's a lot of stuff. There's a few different people involved in Health to Harm. But the way that I always explain it, the way that, that we've, the way it was explained to me is that Health to Harm is like a radio station for the movement. It's, uh, it's a place for people to exchange ideas, to network, to offer trainings. Um, we have a podcast where we do um, just hear some of the backstory uh, of people that are involved in the network. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, in a nutshell. I'll tell you a little bit later, but you can also check out healthtoharm.net to find out more. And our awesome guests today, Ryan and Sarah, both from the Environmental Health Project, um, they're going to tell us a little bit about themselves um, right now before we jump in and get started. But also the agenda is to talk a little bit about why the Environmental Health Channel exists. We're going to learn about that. Um, Ryan's going to give us a demonstration and then the Q&A session is going to happen. So let's, let's jump right in and I will stop sharing my screen and give it over to Ryan and Sarah. Hi, everybody. So my name is Ryan Brody and uh, Thanks, Ryan, for the introduction. But um, yeah, so I work with the Environmental Health Project as the Environmental Science Program Manager, and I am involved in the air quality testing and reporting. Um, and I'm going to get into that a little bit more um, during a demonstration. So I will turn it over to Sarah for the introduction. Um, my name is Sarah Roberts, and I'm a master's in social work intern at the Environmental Health Project. And I do work with the health registry, which we have out in the community right now. And I use the environmental health channel tool to look at um, zip codes with self-reported um, high particulate matter and health impacts to decide who I need to go talk to about completing the registry. Can everybody hear us just fine? I just want to make sure before we continue. It, it does sound like the, the sound is a little muffled. Uh, Kathy just pointed that out as well. Um, yeah, I just saw that call. Yeah. We can bring it in close. Um, when we do the actual presentation, it says if we move closer, you, you don't get to see us. <laughs> okay, but. fantastic. Yeah, that'll be great. Okay, cool. So I'm going to just jump. Oh, sorry. Hold on a sec. I'm going to jump back over to the slideshow and give it to you. Okay, Sarah, you want to take it from here? Oh, okay, sure. Um, so um, part of the problem that we're trying to address with this tool is that health data is often not really accessible um, unless you're a physician. It's often in sort of medical jargon, if you can even access it at all. And so part of the benefit of the environmental health channel is that it's a very clear visual representation of what's going on based on the self-reported data. Um, likewise, a lot of times when residents will go to physicians or lawmakers to try to talk about the concerns that they have with their health around gas development, they will be disregarded or asked to prove their concerns and that's really hard to do. And so with this tool, even if it is a small sample and it is self-reported, you can say, well, based on my zip code, 50% um, of the self-reported data from the zip code shows that other people are having headaches or nosebleeds or whatever it is. Um, so that's really useful. And so it's just a good way to visually um, communicate this data that's a lot more accessible.
you can go to the next slide. I think I hit all those points. Okay, so the Environmental Health Channel, um, part of which Ryan will talk about this in more detail, but we provide air and water monitoring systems for people in southwestern Pennsylvania. And so the data that we use for the Environmental Health Channel is based off of this um, monitoring. And we have very strict criteria that we use to decide what goes into the data set for the Environmental Health Channel. Um, and so as you'll see, this creates a visual map that anyone can access through our website. There's a link which we'll talk about more later. You can go to the next slide. Okay. So Ren's gonna talk about this more, but um, how it works is that we distribute these air and water quality monitors for 32 days we collect data um, and then we punch that data and put it into this visual representation of the area. And we also have stories from local residents and photos. So it's more than just the data itself. It's also there's like faces and stories behind it, which I think is really cool. So um, Ryan's going to talk more about the technical side of it now. Okay, can everybody see me? Can everybody hear me all right? I'm, I'm reading the comments on the bottom that says there's some bounce. Um, I'm guessing everything's okay. Yeah, you might just have to speak up. Yeah, but, yeah. but, it okay. so, but at least somebody said it's improved, so I'll move on with that. Um, um, and I know I don't have an hour to talk, so I'm going to try to keep it so much short. And I want to definitely keep a lot of time open for questions and answers. Um, I kind of think that that's the best way that people learn about this site is seeing it and then asking questions. And that's what um, Sarah and I are both here to do is to answer. So I am going to switch my screen. Um, and can everybody let me know if you see this? I know, Orion, you might have to activate so that I can show my screen. Yeah, somebody just mentioned that they don't see the slides yet. Um, it is coming up. I think Ryan is switching over here in a second. Well, um, well while that's you know happening, I can start by talking about the intro. So um, in 2014, the Environmental Health Project, which I'll call EHP, just to kind of keep it short, um, we began working with residents in in Pennsylvania who believe their air quality or health or both could have been or is impacted by um, local unconventional oil and gas development. For the purpose of that, I'm going to call it UOGD. Um, again, that's just short for unconventional oil and gas development. The reason I do that is because there's a lot more to um, the oil and gas development other than just fracking. So there's the well pads, there's compressor stations, processing facilities, pipelines, and so on. Um, Ryan, as, as we're going, is am I able to take over and show my screen yet or no? I think you have to request again. Can you try that? Sure. Could you just remind me how to do that? Um, if you roll over the screen right at the top, it should okay. sure. give you some options to share, start presence. Start presence. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So is everybody seeing me now? On Oh, yep. oh, now we're going into this funnel again. <laughs> so when you switch your tab, it'll, yeah, perfect. Looks okay, great. So everybody can see this. I can't see your comments anymore. Um, so Ryan, you'll have to maybe, if somebody can't see or hear me, but I'm going to assume that it's working just fine. Okay, move great. On. Okay, great. Yeah, it looks good. So right now we're looking at the landing page of the Environmental Health Channel. Um, to just reflect on what I was saying before, in 2014, EHP began working with residents who believe they could be or are in, um, affected by unconventional oil and gas development. Um, most of the time that's called fracking, but as I mentioned, we don't like to call it just fracking because that only occurs on the well pad. We're looking beyond the truck traffic all the way to when the gas is actually processed. 
Um, so one of the ways that we work with these individuals is by placing air quality monitors at their homes, um, both inside and out. And those are gonna collect real-time air quality measurements pertinent to their health. In addition to collecting the air quality measurements, we also conduct individual health assessments performed by our family nurse practitioner for every person in the home. So over the past five years, EHP has placed air quality monitors at several hundred homes throughout southwestern Pennsylvania, um, northeastern Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, and New York. Um, paired with the environmental data or health assessments, and that's essentially what this website is going to show, is how to interactively look at all that data. So, um, you know, as our database grew, we had a lot of people coming to us saying, we really want to see what you guys are doing. We really want to be a part of this. How can we either contribute or how can we learn from what you are collecting? And so we sort of had an obligation to respond to that. And so, you know, by doing so, we created this environmental health channel, which we're really proud of. Um, and I just want to say that it is it is somewhat new. We just released it in October of 2017. So it's only just about two months old. And, um, and we're still, you know, for lack of better terms, pipelining a lot of data into it. Um, and so what you'll see is kind of just the beginning. So what it's able to do is actually show data across the entire country. And obviously that's a big goal of ours, a long-term goal is to get enough data to show that. But right now what we're gonna focus on is just some data that we have um, already in this site. So I'm gonna start um, by showing the site. And Ryan, is, can, everybody can still see what I'm doing. You can see my cursor bopping around. Is that good? The screen moving? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. So at the top, you're gonna to see, if you follow my cursor, there's a black ribbon that runs across with an overview and then visualization, an FAQ page, and then a contact page. Um, and so those are the four options that we're gonna run through towards the end. But I'll just walk you through. So you start off with just an introduction that you know talks about what the Environmental Health Channel is, that it's an interactive web-based platform to do just what I said, to show all the data that we have, both health and um, air quality. There's also some pictures with narratives to represent you know, stories that people that we've worked with, um, their personal stories that let us know what their situation is. And it also allows people to share their stories. So if they'd like to have you know, um, their background information shared, you can get on here and we can post pictures and we can talk about it so the whole you know, nation can see. Um, and as you scroll down, this is actually a tutorial video that I won't play because I'm basically giving it right now. Um, and then we have a big thank you to everybody who, you know, made this possible, which was the Carnegie Mellon University and their Create Lab. So I will start by jumping right into the data. Um, so you have two options, these two boxes. We're going to start with this option to look at the interactive um, visualization tool. The other option is to look and explore stories from the fracking affected uh, families. So let's start with this. So by clicking it, you're redirected to this page. Um, and I'm Ryan, everybody can see this. It's still working correctly. Everything looks great. Okay, all right. <laughs> I just can't see anybody's comments, so I just wanted to. <laughs> um, so this is essentially the Environmental Health Channel. Um, what you're looking at right now are air quality measurements specific to PM 2.5. So PM 2.5 is a criteria pollutant that's studied by the EPA, um, and we have real-time monitors for them, which we place at you know residents' homes who live near unconventional oil and gas development, such as a fracking well pad, a compressor station, a pipeline, a processing facility, and so on. Um, there's a few parameters that I want to focus on really quickly if you follow my cursor. In the bottom corner, there's the low to high scale, and that represents the level of readings. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Um, and then also at the bottom is this really colorful chart um, with parameters. So what we do, what EHP does is we recognize that exposures do exist um, for PM 2.5 and other air pollutants. There is a DEP standard right now for PM 2.5, but it's a 24 hour standard. Um, we, we don't, Particularly, particularly like to follow that because it may be missing large episodic, you know, high intensity exposures that are only lasting for one hour. 
And then if you average them out over a 24 hour period, you're gonna lose that real high peak. So we look at peaks in terms of 15 minute exposures. Um, and if you'd like to know more, I'm not gonna get real into the details of the analysis and the data numbers. Um, there is some information regarding that in the FAQ section, but we can get to that later. So when we look at exposures and air quality, we focus on five parameters, and they are the accumulation per day of PM 2.5 and milligrams per cubic meter, the peaks per day, the duration of the peaks given in minutes, hours between the peaks, and then a baseline per every house. So we're gonna to start to play around with the data a little bit now. So as you can see, as I hover over different zip codes, um, and by the way, I should have mentioned that earlier, these are all zip codes um, throughout Southwestern Pennsylvania. You can click one, and it'll show you all of the readings within that zip code. So what we see in terms of peaks, our monitors are that they're 3.8 peaks per day. They usually last 26.83 minutes, 6.25 hours in between, and an average baseline for the area is 11. Um, also, I'm gonna go back. If you focus down here again on the chart, you can see how there's all of these strings. So every string, if you follow just one, is an individual database, or data set rather, and it connects across each parameter. And by clicking a certain zip code, it'll only bring up the monitors that exist within that zip code. And what you can do is you can, can click between maybe, if you're living in the um, 15301 zip code, and you wanna compare it to a different zip code, so the 16033 zip code, and you can see how the accumulation goes from 8.6, which is orange, down to 5.57, which is you know, green. The other parameter that you can look at is by clicking the accumulation. Right now, this is all color coded, but you can change it. So if you look at peaks per day, now the colors change, and you can see which zip codes have higher peaks per day than others, which one have longer durations, which ones have a longer period of time in between the exposures, and then lastly, which, which areas report a higher baseline to begin with. Um, I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the time. I know we're, we're running close here, so I'm gonna move on. So the, the next part of the environmental health channel is health. Um, and so just by clicking that you know, tab, you can toggle back and forth between PM and then health. So right now, this is what we have. Like I said, this isn't our entire database, but um, there is a strict criteria for inclusion into the website. Um, so for example, if somebody had a headache and it's been consistent in the last several years and there is no oil and gas development around them, we would not obviously report their symptom as due, being due to oil and gas. Now, if they have the headache and let's say a well pad is developed you know, in close proximity to them and the headaches become more frequent or worse, then we will report that into the, uh, the website. So again, you can see each line down here is a string, and the string is what somebody has reported. And by clicking a zip code, again, you can just look at what this zip code is typically representing. So in this specific 15301 zip code, 29% of people who we've talked to are reporting anxiety, 71 are having skin irritation, 57 are having headache, and you can scroll through. Right now, we are only showing 15 symptoms. Um, of 80 or more that are reported to us. The reason we're picking these 15 is because it's what's most commonly reported to us. Um, our medical staff is interested in the systems that these symptoms are reported with. And also these are very common throughout literature, um, you know, regarding health and fracking. And so again, you can toggle through, you can see how different zip codes compare to each other, or you can just click sleep disruption and see what zip codes are color-coded the worst for that, uh, or skin irritation, or sinuses, headaches, and so on. Um, the last feature I'm gonna talk about, well, I'm sorry, there's two features yet, are these book icons. Um, so if you click one of these icons, what'll happen is a page will appear, and this is where you can tell your story. So if you'd like to work with us and have, you know, submit some pictures, and then a little narrative about it, um, you know, that's an option and it'll be on the zip code that you live in. So you can toggle through different pictures and, and see the people's house and then hear their story, their background, how their water has been affected, um, a picture of where their water is, 
their yard and then the compressor station they live near, the impoundment pond that they live near, pictures of the development as it's happening, and then the readings of the monitors that are given to them. Um, and you can go back and read, you know, different people's stories all over, you know, Ohio and West Virginia and, and Pennsylvania. Um, so the very last thing is the FAQ section. This will redirect you to this page. So we do get some pretty frequently asked questions about how we look at the data or what's included, what's not included. What does the peaks per day mean? What does the accumulated per day mean? Um, and then lastly, um, if you click the contact, it'll redirect you to this. You can put your name, the state you live in, the best way to reach you, your email address, and then you can tell us what you're interested in. If you want to get involved in the air monitoring or sharing a story or asking questions about the health channel or receiving services, you know, otherwise. Um, so just keeping an eye on the time, it looks like we have about seven minutes and I hope that's enough um, time for question and answer. So I'm going to jump back to the page here and try to get us out of this crazy view. <laughs> um, okay, so we're back. All right. Okay, <laughs> I'm reading some of the questions now. Um, <laughs> right, is this great. how we want to do it? Do we want to press them, you know, off of the text or, you, or do you want to take over? Yes, yeah, so what I can do is I can click, um, I'll read off the question to you and then you can answer it. How's that sound? Okay. Cool. I'll well, thanks that. everybody yeah. also who, who, who's here and who asked questions and for anyone who has additional questions, there's a little question uh, box right below the video that you can add things in. So we've got eight questions right now. And also thanks Peter for saying that this is excellent material. Uh, um, I, it was great for me also, Ryan, to see your presentation and to see a little bit how it works. And um, yeah. is Sarah still here as well for the Q&A? I am. I'm actually just shifting stuff around. As oh, great. Speak, so we can yeah, and thanks, thanks yeah. Uh, both of you for coming close to the computer when, when you needed to. Cool. So the first question yeah. um, comes from Alan. Hey, Alan, how's it going? Um, how are the PM2 data tied to oil and gas facilities? How do we know this pollution comes from oil and gas? Right, that's a really good question. Um, so what we do is when people contact us, um, I should maybe say that we don't go out into the community and recruit um, people. Everything that we have is from people who have contacted us and said, I live within a half a mile of a well pad or a well pad is gonna be permitted within a mile of my house and I'm concerned um, and they take advantage of our air monitors or the health data. Um, so one way that we make sure that it is related to oil and gas is that they do live within close proximity. Um, what that typically means is usually within a kilometer or two kilometers. Um, we also ask the record dates that the well pad is being developed and when it's being fracked or when it's being, or when it's being produced. And that way we can follow along with what their readings are in correlation to the stage of the drill. Um, so we don't kind of just, you know, haphazardly place the monitors out in houses. Um, we also have a home exposure assessment that we fill out for everybody, and that'll ask what you live near. So some people report that they live near highways, or some people live near industrial zones that have other things in fracking. We take that into consideration as well. Um, one thing that the Environmental Health Channel does do, is it has that criteria. So if you live near a highway, or you live near um, you know, any other type of industry, we may not display your readings because it's not directly towards or directly related to. Cool. The next question is, where does the data in Environmental Health Channel come from? Right, so all of the data um, is from the monitors that people you know, get from us. So somebody is concerned about their air quality, we lend them two monitors for 32 days. After that 32 days, we get the monitors back and we interpret the data. And um, I'm going to move Peter over because I just got a notification that it's low on time, low on battery. Um, so that's where the data comes from, is all of the uh, monitors that we place out in the community, we get the raw data back and we interpret it and then place it into the... Awesome. Elaine is asking, Common Ground Community Trust wishes to start an air monitoring and water monitoring program. How do we start? and how much does it cost? We're facing 15,000 oil and gas wells in the Rio Grande Valley, where asthma rates are already high. 
Yeah. Um, again, another really great question. Some of these questions are probably going to be better answered um, individually. And so, you know, a common question is how far does air pollution travel? And somebody may have asked that, um, that we might get to. And that's really a difficult question because there's not a golden answer. It depends on topography, it depends on wind direction, cloud coverage, the weather, what source you're living near, how much production is occurring. Um, and this is one of those type of questions. You know, to get something started in your community, we would kind of need to know what's in your community and what you, you know, intend on monitoring, uh, and also what you intend on monitoring for. So right now we're looking at PM 2.5, but we do a fair amount of volatile organic compounds or VOC monitoring as well. Um, so if you're looking to get into that, that's a whole other conversation, probably something that's going to be a little bit too long of an answer to have here. Um, but uh, if you visit our contact page and give us a call, I'd be really happy to talk to you about it. <clears throat> awesome. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another question from Elaine is, do you provide baseline measurements prior to unconventional gas drilling impacts? What is the best way to set up? Yep. Is this a citizen science program? Yeah, so we do provide baseline. Um, it, we to get a baseline before we do any sort of actual measurements. Um, unfortunately, it's difficult sometimes because people don't know that a well pad or another type of um, infrastructure will be coming to them until it's actually being built. Um, unless you're actively searching for permits in your area, there's usually not a whole lot of ways that you'll know that information. So we do try to collect as much baseline as we can, um, you know, but sometimes it's difficult. Peter's asking, uh, has a question on data quality from the locally placed monitors versus regulatory style, high quality data. <clears throat> yeah, so the monitors that we have, um, they are called spec air quality monitors and you can go on specsensor.com and check them out. Uh, I believe that what you're referring to are some of the more complex monitors that maybe DEP uses or local air or um, local uh, health agencies use. Um, we would love to use those, we really would, but the cost of them is, is pretty high. To get them out to hundreds of houses all over, you know, Pennsylvania and Ohio, New York or wherever else, um, as a nonprofit, that's not an option, you know, so that's kind of one answer. Um, we do like to place our monitors next to some of those higher end equipment to, you know, see how they're comparing. Um, so that's, you know, one way that we use them. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. And uh, Catherine is asking, when did you collect PM baseline? Most of the PM comes from diesel, or do you feel that it comes from sulfur dioxide? Yeah, truck traffic is definitely a concern. Um, there's different sizes of PM related to truck traffic. Uh, but we try to collect baseline, like I said, for 32 days before anything is developed. And so regardless of what it's coming from, it exists. You know, whether it's from a truck or whether it's from silica or whether it's from any other source, um, the problem is that it, it does exist. And so we're, we're doing our best to monitor it. Awesome. <clears throat> um, Carolyn says, in a previous different study, Navajo Nation had concern about anonymity. So just using ZIP will protect this concern. I um, hope I'm reading this correctly. Um, yeah, we had, um, I'm sorry, what's up the end of it? Yeah. Yeah, we had concerns about um, privacy because we can't, you know, give a you know, satellite image that shows exactly where the monitor was because it could be somebody's house. Uh, we didn't want to pull it back too far and show, you know, countywide scale because then you would be seeing areas where it's really high dense with oil and gas versus areas with very little and it would kind of average out. So to find that good area, we, we chose to work with um, zip code. Um, the population is high enough in some zip codes where you wouldn't be able to tell who it is. Um, and some of them are low enough that you'd be able to tell kind of an area where there's a lot of oil and gas and other areas where there's not. Mm -hmm. Greg is asking, has this process begun to collect data in Ohio or West Virginia? 
We have. Uh, we have a fair amount in West Virginia, and we're collecting a lot currently in Ohio. Um, like I said, the site is only two months old to date, uh, and so we're really still streaming in a lot of data to it. Um, if you just keep checking it, we'll, we're doing our best to update it as far as we can. Um, somebody just popped a question at the bottom, says, where in Ohio? Um, I'm not sure I can give the exact town, and I unfortunately don't know the zip code off the top of my head. Um, but it is in the eastern, let's see, central east state. Great. Aaron is asking, can any state or federal enforcement action be taken against companies based on this monitoring data? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm sure you can. <laughs> it's not something that we get involved with. Our... Um, our organization is public health oriented. And so the first thing we want to do is discover if there is an exposure, how great the exposure is, how often they're happening, and then immediately how can we reduce the exposure. Uh, beyond that, if they want to take their data and use it to argue against industry or, or you know, do as it with, you know, as they wish, that's that's fine. That's up to them. Um, the data technically would belong to them. We're just you know, interpreting it and giving them a report. Great. Um, <clears throat> Ron is asking, would like to set up air quality monitoring around a local refinery in our town in Pennsylvania? Yeah, um, we, can, we can set that up. All you'd have to do is visit the contact page and get our number. You can visit our website, which is environmentalhealthproject.org. Um, just give us a call and you know we're happy to talk to you and set something up. And, <clears throat> Natalie, and and actually, this is the last question. Natalie is asking, what is the oil and gas industry required to monitor in terms of air quality? Do they have to monitor 24-7? Um, again, another, another good question, um, complex. So it depends, I guess, on the source. Um, if you're looking at compressor stations, which may be different than uh, well pads and are different than refineries, um, you know, I, Natalie, if you'd like to call and, and we can talk about where you're living near and see what they're monitoring for. Sometimes townships or additional monitoring. Um, so it's, a, it's always kind of a different answer. <laughs> Sorry mm -hmm. to give those, to report those answers so frequently as I am, but that's kind of just how it is. Great. And, um, <clears throat> It looks like uh, Peter has a question. The limits to the claims based on data will always be limited by the precision and accuracy of the data. Is there a pathway in your program such that once data indicates potential exceedance values or health risks to hand the data or questions up to the state? Um, hmm, let me think about what that's asking. Is there a pathway in your program such that once the data indicates so we don't, if I'm answering this correctly, we don't have um, a system that as soon as the data exceeds what we would consider a health protective standard that it would be transferred to the state. Um, we have met with DEP several times and worked with HSDR, um, which is the Agency for Toxic Disease Substance Registry, um, and presented them with what we're finding. Um, they're really happy with that and they're happy the way we're doing it. And we continue to meet with them periodically. Um, you know, what, it's difficult because, like I said, DEP has a 24-hour standard, but we're not looking at that 24-hour standard. Uh, we will examine some of our data sets to see if they breach it, um, but we're more concerned in the short-term high-intensity um, episodic exposure. Great. And the final, final question now from Ellen is, does any of the data include monitoring of compressors or metering stations? Yeah, so it does. Um, and again, being so new, there are still some additions we want to bring to the health channel. Um, one of them is to put a filter on so you can see data that's very specific to well pads uh, or compressors or medium stations or pig launching activities or truck traffic. Um, the other filter would be to place oil and gas locations across the map. 
So when you look at a certain zip code, you can see, you know, exactly how much, how many well pads there are, how many compressor stations there are, where pipelines run, um, any of that information. Um, yeah, so, you know, just continue to check the site and we're going to continue to update it and put more data into it as we collect it. Awesome. That is um, great. We just got through a whole bunch of questions and um, I'm just going to jump over real quick because I know that you had a couple things left just in terms of talking about some upcoming features and, um, and also, uh, let me see here. Here we go. So can you see my screen? Yes. <clears throat> okay, great. Yeah. So you had talked about some upcoming features and then, um, and then that's it. So you want to take a, a sec to tell us about those? Sure. So um, I did kind of just briefly mention them, but uh, you know, we'd love to put location of oil and gas activity across the map. And so when somebody is looking at a zip code, they can actually see, you know, this zip code has, um, you know, twice as many well pads or, you know, three compressors where this other zip code only has one. Um, we'd also are planning to include a time scale. So on the bottom, you'll be able to start in 2014 when we start our collecting data all the way to the current day, whatever day it's going to be that you're looking at it. And you'll be able to see, you know, how many monitors were recording data during the specific, you know, maybe three months at a time or a, a six months or a year. And then also see how much, uh, you know, the density of oil and gas locations during that specific time as well. So there's a whole lot that we're going to, you know, plan on doing with this site and make it as powerful as possible. And ultimately our goal is to, you know, educate and inform um, people who are curious, you know, to say, I live in this area or I work in this area or I frequently visit this area and I have concerns and, uh, you know, that's, that's the goal to, to answer all those questions. Great. So, uh, for, for presenting. Um, everybody that came, I'm going to send you a link to the replay, but also a quick survey just about the webinars because I, we have a bunch of future trainings coming up and I'd love to hear uh, ideas and things that people are interested in just for me to reach out. Also, if you want to present a training, that's something that we do here with Health to Harm. And if there's any other questions, we can stick around a little bit after but just wanted to thank everybody and tell you to um, check out healthtoharm.net as well if you want to get involved because we have a directory, um, hundreds of people around um, North America that are involved in networking and connecting with each other and providing uh, tools and services to the network. So definitely check that out as well um, when you have a moment. And uh, thank you so much. Um, Ryan for showing us the channel and thanks Sarah for coming on. It's nice to see you again. We met uh, a few weeks back through the network. And I actually have a question for you, Sarah, as we're wrapping up, which is um, what's the, like the role of the stories and, you know, just in terms of like connecting people and, and, you know, their own personal stories into the map is that's, I heard that that's one of the things that you were working on. So um, the other master is in social work intern, that's her project, and I might tag along with her to go do these stories, but it's it's not actually my project. Um, do you want me to talk about why it's important, though? That'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. Um, well, I think for me as a social work student, um, I can see the connection between putting sort of a face and a story behind this data because I think it's a lot more compelling than just looking at the data itself. And I think that's part of why we have the environmental health channel is that it's a visual representation of the data. And so it's like a step up um, in a lot more comprehensive. And for me, as someone who learns in a more visual way, it's a lot easier to understand the environmental health channel than just looking at numbers. And likewise, it's a lot more relatable when I see these people's stories and photos as to um, the impacts that are happening. And I think that it's also important to um, 
with the environmental health channel, we're essentially making the data that these people have given us and we're um, comprehending it and giving it back to them, which I think is important out of respect to them. And I think likewise, it's important to give them a platform for their stories. And so I think that including people from the community in this way is an important um, way to thank them for being part of the process. Yeah, I, lo I loved like from for me when I first saw the the map, I was just like kind of blown away. But then seeing that aspect of it made it so much more real. It sort of I feel like without that social aspect, it, it would be easy to just look at it as numbers, even though the numbers are, are really important. But it definitely like different part of the way that we think about the data. Is there anything else that either of you would like to add? Thanks, Jessa. <laughs> well, oh, you're mean the uh, other Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I think <laughs> I think that we covered you know the site. Um, you know, obviously we're we're really happy and excited to talk with anybody who wants to see more of what we do. Um, this is just one very small part of it. We just have a whole health registry released that I kind of want to put a plug in for. Um, so visit the website, visit our, you know, environmental health channel, our environmental health project website, and, uh, you know, see what all we do. And if we can do anything for you, just let us know. Awesome. And uh, thanks, Peach Latte, for for dropping in the halt -harm .net. Um Yeah, definitely want to encourage folks to check out the network. It's how um, it's how we got connected. It's how, um, you know, essentially with this, this is a way that we, those of us, you know, all of you that are on the webinar currently, but then also other people that are involved in this, in this movement. This is one of the ways that we get to uh, share with each other and collaborate and share the different tools that we're um, offering the services, the projects that we're working on, the unique skills and expertise that we bring to the movement. Uh, the way that the network is structured is that it's a directory. And there's only three things that uh, we built the directory around. So it's really simple. We're not trying to like build another social network for people. Um, it's just, you know, who are you and, and where are you located? What are your interests and what are your skills? And those three things are essentially the way that we build the web that is our movement where we're able to stand up for the health of our communities, the health of, of the land, we're able to stand up against the oil and gas industry. And so, you know, our, our goal essentially through Health the Harm Network is to use the network model to really collaborate and share with each other. And so this training is just one example of that happening. And because Ryan uh, filled out a form to do a training, that came through and we looked at it and then we, we got on the phone and we started to, to connect. And um, I met Sarah because Sarah jumped in on one of our uh, welcome sessions. We do um, kind of like office hours every once in a while within the network and people jump in the office hours and connect. Um, I recognize a few other people in the chat from the network. So, um, you know, shout out to, to Ranjana and Jessa and, um, you know, and everybody else that, that I see that, that jumped in the chat and said hi, uh, Sam um, and uh, Alan, who I met down at the, at the conference. But I don't know if you have a profile yet, Alan, but you should definitely get around to it. So check it out. And also thanks, uh, Peach Latte, for dropping in a commongroundrising.org in the trenches right now, urgent issues with deadlines soon. So yeah, definitely um, we have to support each other. That's what this is all about. So. Um, thank you so much. Thanks, Celia. Um, and I'll be following up with you with some links and the replay as well. You can share around. All right. Okay. Thank you, Ryan, for putting everything together. <laughs> absolutely. It's it was great great working with you. Let's do this again. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Cool. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye. Bye.